All right, so for the rest of the day, I'm going to talk about academic activities and literacy, which are two of my favorite areas, which is why we're going to spend a lot of time looking at them. Um, but hopefully, how many of you are, are classroom people? Number of you. And how many of you have children in classrooms? Excellent, right? So you can go back and, and share with your schools. Um, so I want to spend some time talking about access, right? Access and participation, because for a lot of the individuals that we're thinking about, our children or the, the individuals that we're supporting, they have difficulty accessing the content of the classroom, accessing the information from the teacher, and they have difficulty participating, especially if they don't have the language abilities, the communication abilities, or the background knowledge. Right? If they don't know about the topic, it's hard to participate. So when we're thinking about access, right, there are a whole bunch of things kids need to access in the classroom, um, and a bunch of things that individuals with autism and developmental disabilities have difficulty accessing. They have difficulty accessing whole group instruction, which is what this is, essentially. I'm standing up here, I'm telling you a bunch of stuff, and you're like listening to it, hopefully accessing it. I see heads nodding so often, so I, I'm assuming you're with me. Um, group discussion. Individuals have difficulty accessing group discussion. So small group activities where you're supposed to like talk with your friends in your group about an idea. Lots of times people have difficulty accessing that because they're not understanding the language. Um, students might also have difficulty with things like reading for information, getting information off of the page. So those are all access. How do I access knowledge and information? Um, as well, individuals often have difficulty with participation. I mean, you think about how do kids participate in the classroom? Well, they ask and answer questions. Um, they engage in group discussion, either large group discussion with the whole class or smaller group discussion. Um, they participate in learning activities with their peers, and they engage in independent learning activities, the things that they're supposed to do at their desk, little assignments. And for a lot of our students, they have difficulty accessing the materials, accessing the language of instruction, and because of those access difficulties um, and because of their own communication challenges, then they also can't participate. And they end up not participating, right? So I want to give you a whole bunch of ideas of ways that we can improve access and improve uh, participation for individuals in classrooms. So I'm going to kind of talk about a few different things, then I'm going to show you lots of examples and tell you some humorous stories of kids, and, right? because that's always way more entertaining. Um, so first of all, thinking about group instruction, right? which is kind of like what we're doing here. One of the things that I often will recommend or things that I used for kids were, I call them instruction guides. Just visual supports that are related to whatever topic the teacher is teaching about. Um, in terms of the individual, we can sort of adjust the level of complexity uh, for the student. So a lot of times I'm working with students where the class is talking about a topic that's quite complex and I have a student who's learning sort of basic requesting skills maybe, right? They might not know anything about the topic that's happening, so I need to lower the level of complexity quite a lot to allow them to participate. And those are the kinds of kids often that I find are not participating in classrooms because everybody else's knowledge is so much above where their knowledge is. Right, so I'm always trying to look for creative ways that we can get those kids participating. So hopefully I give you some ideas. Um, these kinds of instruction guides we can provide in various formats. So an individual student might have paper-based information that's just on their desk. But more and more, in teachers' classrooms, there are smart boards. They have projectors. Teachers could be making these supports electronically and projecting them for all of the students to see. And think about the composition of our classrooms now. Right? Who else comprise classrooms, not kids with disabilities, but other kids who might benefit from visual supports that are related to the topic of instruction? Who else might these kinds of things help? ESL. Yeah, ESL students love it when teachers start using visual supports. They're like, oh, thank you, right? I have a sense of what it is we're talking about. So as their, their English language skills are developing, who else? I often find that kids who have difficulty maintaining attention, 
do better if you provide some visuals. It gives them something else to focus on. Um, sometimes students with learning disabilities find these kinds of things helpful, right? So from a cognitive standpoint, that's not the issue, but it's often a bit more sort of attentional and focusing their attention on the right stuff. So these are things too that can help more than just say the kid with autism in the classroom. And if we can help classroom teachers understand that, that this is a big bang for your buck, um, it also helps teachers kind of recognize the usefulness of these kinds of strategies. Um, so the other nice thing is, is that they don't have to be made by the teacher. Sometimes the teachers will make these, but I've had situations too where I've had kids in either upper elementary grades or at the high school level, and we're using just drawing as a way of making the teacher talk visual, and I'll have a peer assigned to the student with a disability, and their job will be, here's, here's a book of plain paper, and your job is to listen to the teacher and essentially draw a schemata of what the teacher's talking about. Stick figures, a few words here or there. Um, and it's actually useful for the peers too. It's kind of like graphic note taking. And so you think about that too in terms of the peer, they have to take in and understand the information to put it down on paper in a way that they're their peer with autism, for example, can understand. So peers can do this in the heat of the moment. I've had SEAs do this in the heat of the moment too, right? Where again, the SEA's job is not then to sort of poke the student and say, listen to the teacher, listen to the teacher. The SEA's job is to listen to the teacher and sketch out what the teacher's talking about in whatever level of complexity is appropriate for the student, right? And sometimes very basic, okay? Um, so peers and teaching assistants can help with that. Uh, peers and teaching assistants also can help if I've pre-made some sort of instructional guide, some sort of visual support. Sometimes what I'll have the peer do is just simply point to orient. This is the part we're talking about now. And now we're talking about this part. So sometimes just helping the individual, the student with autism, know where we're at in the conversation, know where we're at in the lesson. All right, so let me show you some examples because that will help you. Um, this is a, an instruction guide that I made for a student. Um, and it was to highlight the key points of a teacher's lesson. So they were learning about Napoleon. Now the teacher was talking about Napoleon at a much more complex level, much more information. But for this student, we were looking at very basic. So Napoleon was born on August 15th, 1769. So when the teacher was talking about Napoleon being born and when he was a young child, this is the part of the information that we wanted that student to get. Um, Napoleon's mom was, Napoleon's dad was, Napoleon lived, where he lived, where, what town that was in, what the capital city was. He had four brothers and three sisters and where he went to school. So these were the basic facts that we wanted our student to learn in the context of this unit on Napoleon and whatever else it was that the teacher was teaching as part of, of this lesson, okay? So now he's got a sense of what it is we're talking about, okay? And we'll come back and talk about how we also use this to support participation. So if the teacher asked questions, that the student could use this same visual to answer basic questions. So we'll come back to that. Um, this is another example of a visual to support an understanding of lessons. I did not make this, but this is available freely online. This is the periodic table of elements in pictures. Wow, yeah, I wish that like when I was in high school I had this, because uh, wow, I know, I know. Now even better is that they've made other materials. So you can see that they've got, you know, whatever the, the element is, and, it's, and then it's got like a regular image, like a cell phone or a light bulb or whatever it is. Um, they also have individual cards for all the elements that you can print out and then use for instructional activities, right? But think about this. I could have a student in, in class at high school where they're talking about the periodic table of elements, but I can direct some questions to a student with autism or developmental disability, um, like what element do we find in coins? And all they need to do is find the picture of coins. If they can say nickel, they say nickel. If they can't say nickel, they can hold up the card. That's right, it's nickel. Or their peer can read it out for them, right? I don't care. But in this case, now they're paying attention to the lesson. 
They have a way to participate. They're learning something, right? Now, you might be thinking, well, why does a kid with autism need to learn about the periodic table of elements? My second question or my response to that is, why does any child need to learn about the periodic <laughs> table of elements? Right? Why do we... Why do we learn about all of these things in school? Why do we learn about Romeo and Juliet? Does that matter? How many of you could live as an adult just fine having never read Romeo and Juliet? All of us, right? But why do we, why do we read Romeo and Juliet in school? Why do we learn about the periodic table of elements? Why do we learn about these things? The common, knowledge base. common knowledge base, right? It's about exposure, right? Why don't we all have access, if some of us, my, my other way of thinking about this is, if I have to learn about the periodic table of elements, boy, you're gonna have to as well. If I have to be in pain, you're gonna be in pain with me, right? But it's really about, this is common knowledge. This is, this is stuff that everybody kind of has at least heard about. Well, why wouldn't we expose individuals with developmental disabilities in a meaningful way? Why not? Everybody else has to suffer through it. Right? Why not the kid with autism? But let's make it meaningful. Right? Let's, let's make it useful. And I can embed all kinds of stuff in here. So I, we can be working on key words like coins and poison. I might have a kid where we're just working on color matching. Right? So if I've got a kid in a high school classroom who's working on color matching, can you find me an element that, that's made of the same thing as nickels? And they have to look and find something else that has a green background. Right? But they're still working on paying attention, responding to questions, coming up with answers at whatever level that's appropriate to them. Right? So go download this. The link is in your handouts. Um, they've got such cool stuff. But this whole periodic table of elements in pictures is amazing. So there's stuff like that. Um, this is something that I made for a student where they were having a class lesson on the history of transportation in Canada. And so we just made really basic sentences. What happened during this period of time, that period of time, and so on and so forth. So as the teacher's talking, there were things that the student could refer to. Right? So when I talk about instructional guides, these are the kinds of things that I'm talking about. Really basic visual supports that are related to the content and help the individual know what the heck it is we're talking about. Right? And perhaps identify the key facts or the key pieces of understanding we want our students to go away knowing. All right? The other thing that we can do is look at story guides. Right? Think about the read aloud stuff that happens in classrooms. It happens with younger kids, but it also happens often with older kids where the teacher will read a book, either a story book or later on a novel to the students. Um, and there are a whole bunch of things we can do around this. So we can kind of rewrite the text and provide a rewritten version to the student that's perhaps just simplified. Let's just, you know, fewer sentences, short, sweet, to the point. We might add symbols to that. Um, we might also think about comic stripping the text, right? Making it kind of like a, a comic strip, right? To help individuals and think about, you know, what are we supposed to do when we're reading? We're kind of like, reading is like making pictures in your head. And if somebody's telling us stuff, we should be making pictures in our head. That's the understanding part of things. So comic stripping is sometimes a way to help kids start to figure out, oh, that's what they should be doing while they're reading. But let me show you um, an example of a few, and I'll kind of tell you the story that goes with. Uh, so when I was teaching, I had one of my deaf students with autism in a grade four class, and her grade four teacher was going to read the novel Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing to all of the students. You guys familiar with Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, Judy Bloom? Oh, it's hilarious. Those of you who have not read it must, must go read it. Um, the basic premise of the story is uh, the older child in the family, Peter, fourth grade, he was the fourth grade nothing, had a younger brother, Fudge, that's what they called him, he was four, and Fudge did all kinds of problematic things, and so the whole book is basically about how Peter hates having this little brother because this little brother does all kinds of, of bad things and gets in the way and, you know, messes things up very badly for Peter. Uh, so the teacher was going to read this to all of the kids in the class in ASL, okay? Now, my student had some ASL skills. She had some ability to understand, but not enough 
that she would be able to keep up with that reading. So I knew that. And the teacher came to me ahead of time. She said, like, in a couple of weeks, here's the plan. I want to read this novel. So she gave me a heads up. Um, so what I decided to do was that I would work with this student during her one-on-one -on -one resource time. And we worked ahead of the teacher. So the teacher gave me a two-week lead-in. I started working pretty much right away. So that the student had exposure to the novel before the teacher read whatever chapter. So we did chapter one before the teacher read chapter one. We were always at least a chapter ahead. So during the student's resource time, she would come to my room and she was very, very interested in books. And I knew that she was going to be a reader, a real reader. Um, and she just loved books, loved text. So I actually wanted her to see me create the adaptation from the real book because I knew she'd be really motivated by that, knowing that this stuff was coming from an actual book because um, I wanted to keep her motivated to actually get to the point where she was reading the real book. So she'd come and sit down with me. I had a whole stack of plain paper. And what I would do, I had read the story, but again, I wanted her to realize that the information I was putting on paper was coming from an actual book. So I'd pick up the book and I'd hold it and go, like I was reading it. And then I'd draw a picture and I'd write kind of one or two sentences that grossly summarized a large section of the text, okay? Um, I was also working on some of her individual goals at the same time. So she was working on making predictions, what will happen next. Uh, we were working on that theory of mind, how do other people feel, what are other people thinking. And so whenever I had the opportunity to embed a, all right, so what do you think is going to happen next? Here's the pen and paper you draw for me. Or, hmm, this one thing happened. How do you think this character is going to feel? You draw for me. Right? So I'd give her opportunities to, to participate in that. And so we were always a chapter ahead. She had this binder of our drawings and my kind of gross summaries. And when the teacher read chapter one, she was sitting in the classroom with her chapter one in the binder in front of her. Now, she already knew what happened in chapter one because she and I had gone through chapter one. So she'd watch the teacher signing. And if she got lost, she'd refer to her ad ad adapted version. And if she wasn't quite sure where the information was coming from, her aide was nearby, her aide would sort of flip to the right page and point out and then sign in a way that she understood at a lower language level. Remember when this and this and this? And they'd have a little conversation. And, oh, got it. And then she'd go back to watching the teacher. Okay. So here's what some of the pages of the adaptation looked like. So this was an illustration straight out of the book. Whenever there was an illustration, we'd just go to the photocopier and make a copy. So Peter, who's the older brother, saw Fudge cutting his hair. Peter saw hair in Dribble's bowl. Dribble is Peter's turtle. Peter saw colors on Fudge's face. Peter felt, and then I made a line. Right, as we're working on how do people feel, right? So we read this. So I'd show it to her. She'd read it. She'd sign it. And then I said, well, how did he feel? And she signed to me mad. So OK, I'll write mad down. So well, this is a good point to now do a little bit of predicting. What do you think will happen next? So I asked her. And she would then take the paper and she would draw what she thought would happen next. And we used thought bubbles. And she was very familiar with the idea of a thought bubble as what's going on in your head. So here's what she thought. Peter will wash the turtle. And she made a big point of, of showing me that his face was flat. She said to me, he is not happy, not happy. His face is flat. So there he is washing the turtle. I said, OK, well, good enough. And then what do you think will happen? And she said, Peter will yell at Fudge. Notice that there are devil horns on Peter, and there's a little angel halo on Fudge. And I actually got the full dramatization of this. You know, she stood up, and you kind of see how Fudge's hands are, are rounded. It was this. And he was doing this, you know, that like, oh, but not me. Right? Um, and you also see, and this is a deaf child who does not hear, who does not talk. This is a speech bubble. And there's the, the turtle's bowl with an X in it. Because he is saying, no turtle. She knows way more than people gave her credit for. Right? So I said, OK, good. So there was yelling. Then what happens? And she says, 
Peter will lock the door, and here he is locking the door, and again, notice he's whistling a happy tune. Those are music notes. Again, she's never heard anybody whistle. How did she know that? She knew way more things than we ever thought she did, right? But she figured that, that he's gonna get a lock on the door, which actually, at this point of the story, had been a bit of a theme, because Fudge was always getting into Peter's stuff, and Peter kept asking his family, and so she figured that this was gonna do it, that this is when he would get a lock. So that was that novel. Worked beautifully, right? She could participate in the readings. She knew what was coming up. During our resource time, right, not only were we adapting the book, but I was working on her individualized goals, right? So it was like win, 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 win everywhere. Um, then the teacher came back after they did Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, and she said, well, here's the next novel we're doing. Said, okay, well, great. I've got other things I want to work on during her resource block, and, and she now understands where the adaptations are coming from. So I'm just going to adapt this on my own, because it will be faster that way. Um, over subsequent novels, and they did a couple more that year, I increased the amount of text, right? So more and more text um, as we went along. And eventually, I moved to using comic strips. So I comic stripped out what was happening. So much more text and then associated comic strips. And I'll show you what that looks like. Um, rather than adapting it together, I adapted it myself and then she previewed it one-on-one -on -one with me. So we read through it together and I could target some of the things, again, in terms of her reading skills that we were targeting. One of those things being um, that when a deaf person is reading, they're reading English, but if they're signing, they're signing ASL, right? They're not the same languages, they don't have the same grammar. So she was learning essentially how to translate and the coolest thing was she was doing it, in fact, better than many of her same age non-disabled peers, um, where she could read an English sentence, translate that into ASL, and then sign it correctly uh, in ASL. So that was very cool, especially when I, you know, she was 10 at this point, and she wasn't really using ASL till she was about six. She's a smart girl. Um, and we continued to work on things like predicting, understanding other people's thoughts and feelings, that kind of stuff. So the second book that they did that year was Owls and the Family. So this is what the text looked like. You know, Billy woke up, oh no, wool, wool is the owl, was gone. Billy was worried, Billy looked for wool. And so I asked her, what do you think happened to him? She figured a cat got him, right? That's not actually what happened, but you know, that's a good prediction. The next uh, story that they did, the next novel was called Chocolate Fever. And now you can see that the text has um, increased significantly. So this is chapter five, there's the, the title of the chapter, and here are all of the sentences. So it's still pretty gross summarizations, um, simplified sentences, but much more text. And the other thing that I did is I would put a number between or before a sentence, and the number was related to that part of the comic strip so that she could see the connections, and essentially, these are the pictures she should start making in her head when she's reading. And it was interesting, the first day I gave her the first page of chapter one, and I put it out in front of her, and always on the left was the text, and on the right was the comic strip. And my assumption, my prediction, was that she was going to begin by looking at the comic strip. And that after she looked at the comic strip, she'd go through and make her way through the text. When in fact, what she did is this. She went over to the text, took her pointer finger, and she skimmed the text. Then she went over and she looked at the comic strip. Then she went back and signed in ASL the sentences. I know, I was like thrilled. So that was the end of grade four. The beginning of grade five, they were doing Charlotte's Web. So again, I adapted the text, but this time I gave her the blank squares to do her own comic strip. So during her resource blocks, this is what we did. She would read and then she would do the drawing. And about part way through, I think this is actually the last page of the novel where I was having her draw the comic strip because it was clear that she was understanding everything. And it was like, we don't need to spend any more time having you draw, especially because she's quite finicky about things being just right. You see how things are colored in extra hard 
And that's because like every paw of Wilbur has to be exactly the same and all, right? Perfection is a big deal. So it was like, we'll be here till you're 47 if you're gonna draw everything. Clear that you understand, we're just gonna move on and you can just read and sign the text, right? Um, the cool thing is, is that at about the same time the Tigger movie had just come out, it's a while ago, uh, but she loved the Tigger movie. And I happened to see at a store one day a mini novel of the Tigger movie. And I bought it for her. And she read that right off the text. Right? Now, simplified, yes. She'd seen the movie. She had some background knowledge. But nevertheless, within you know, a little more than a year, she had sort of a novelette, if you will, that she was reading directly off the page. Right? And this is a kid who, at six years old, was engaging in very severe problem behavior and had very min minimal language. Very minimal language. So that was very exciting. So that's one thing you can do. 